welcome to Service Headline News. I am Marty Smith. I'm Eric Perrott. And I'm Jake Wall. And we're here to bring you the latest headlines and updates pertinent to all servicemen and women. So sit back, get informed, and maybe have a laugh at the Swearing In Podcast presents Service Headline News. Happy New Year, fellas. Welcome back for a brand new 2023 of more headline news. I'm excited, man. Excited. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this, man. (laughs) Dead air. (laughs) It's good for you. How do we start our history day off in the new year? All right, man. Well, I've got a good one for you. It, it it's well known, and it's also not the third or fourth of January. It's actually for the first of January because I thought it'd be interesting to bring this one in. Um, for but the nobody's grading us on if we get the date exact. Much like that. Master Sergeant Wall criticized me a couple months ago for not getting the <laughs> date correct. So I appreciate oh, that. Did so this occurred January first, nineteen sixty-two. Can you guys guess what it is? Uh, First orbit or something? No. At the start of the Vietnam War, President John F. Kennedy recognized the need for unconventional warfare and special operations as a measure to combat guerrilla warfare. On May 25th, 1961, Kennedy spoke of his deep respect for the United States Army Special Forces in a speech to Congress. In this speech, where he also announced the government's plan to put a man on the moon, he announced his intention to spend over $100 million to strengthen the U.S. Special Operations Force and expand American capabilities in unconventional warfare. Does that help? (laughs) Okay. I I can can guess. All right. he He created the Green Berets? No, man, that was the inception the of the SEALs. Oh, the SEAL. January 1st, 1962, uh, the Navy then needed to determine its role within the Special Operations Arena. In March of 61, Admiral Arleigh Burke, Chief of Naval Operations, recommended the establishment of guerrilla and counter guerrilla units. These units would be able to operate from sea, air, or land, thus creating the Navy SEALs. The original SEALs came from the Navy's underwater demolition teams, UDTs, which had already gained extensive experience in commando warfare in Korea. However, the UDTs were still necessary for the Navy's amphibious force, so they were not completely disbanded. The first two Navy SEAL teams were formed in January 1st, 1962, and stationed on both coasts of the United States. Team 1 at Naval Amphibious Base Coronado in San Diego, California, and Team 2 at Naval Amphibious Base Little Creek in Virginia Beach. The SEALs' missions were to conduct counter-guerrilla warfare and clandestine operations in maritime and river environments. Hence, you got your badasses in the Navy. Huh. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I thought most people would know about that, but the, the, because everybody talked about the underwater demolition teams and clearing obstacles for, you know, landings, and that's where your yeah. your frogman term came from. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't realize when, uh, and, I, you know, my brother would kill me because I, I guessed the Green Berets, but I know the Green Berets were made back in the 50s. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, I, I had no idea that that was a creation of the actual seal. Yeah. And Kennedy, I mean, think about that. It's a, a Democrat talking about strengthening the military. That's pretty cool, too. That gets yeah, him. Cool. Yeah, but that but he was also he was a PT boat commander, you know, so he had his military background, like yep. most of those guys did back then. So uh, you know, if you relatively speaking, the Navy SEALs are a very young force, you know. They've only been around since 62. Yeah. Uh I wonder who's older the rangers or the marines well i'd say the marines are older than the rangers i don't know rangers the marines were incepted in what 1770s something yeah but the rangers were i I don't know when the when the exactly the rangers were 
the Rangers. You know what I mean? Well, I know they've been Army Rangers. Rangers or something of that effect before the maybe be, maybe before they got the name. Yeah, I think there was a guy back in um, the early 1700s that used the term Rangers for his troops too, and I can't remember his name. Yeah, I don't want to say like Texas Rangers turned into the Rangers, but um, maybe. Well, I guess there was a bunch of terms. I mean, there was a guy named Gorham. Gorham's Rangers was one of the most famous and effective ranger unit raised in colonial North America. What year? 1770. Oh. Yeah. And then you've got the King's Carolina Rangers. They were a Loyalist militia regiment active during the American Revolutionary War. Here's the one I was talking about, Major Robert Rogers. Yeah, Rogers Rangers. I remember yeah. that one. That was one of the first ones. But I don't know. I think the Marines may have still been first. Huh? Could be. Somebody call in and let us know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, got it. Thanks, Eric. That was a good little history on the SEALs. Yeah. Um, especially, especially when you consider Kennedy was a Navy guy, so maybe he was a little bit more inclined to uh, to go. Oh, let's go special ops in the water. Let's make the SEALs. Yeah. Uh, Okay, got a few stories here. Interesting to see what you think about this. Um, ran across this one that was just published uh, on, on let's see, yesterday. Um, the This isn't really the headline, but I, I've cut it down. Uh, the Air Force is undergoing efforts to launch cruise missiles out of the back of C-130s. <laughs> hey, no, oh, nice. it's pretty cool. That just cracks me up. <laughs> um, Rapid Dragon is the name for the Air Force effort to launch long-range missiles from cargo pallets dropped out of the back of cargo aircraft. In November, two Air Force MC-130Js successfully conducted a live-fire demonstration of Rapid Dragon using a joint air-to-surface standoff missile or a JASM, I guess yeah, they call it, uh, over Norway. Which is a really tough acronym to say correctly. Jasm. Rapid dragon, um, huh? <laughs> so basically, basically that's a cruise missile, I think. Uh an M1 an MC 130J is a perfect aircraft for this capability because we can land and operate from a three thousand from three thousand foot highways and austere landing zones, whereas a bomber cannot, said Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Valerie Knight commander of the 352nd Special Ops Wing. The JASM's long range, combined with the MC-130J's ability to land where bombers cannot, would be bad news for any possible enemies. Uh, the Air Force Research Lab wrote on its website, quote, rapidly deployable palletized munitions can saturate the airspace with multiple weapons and effects, complicate adversary targeting solutions, help open access for critical target prosecution, and deplete an adversary's air defense munitions stockpile. Okay, so if I understand what you're saying correctly, it's on a pallet, it's dropped out the back end, Yeah. and then the missiles are launched? And then they ignite and go. Yeah, yeah. somehow they, they set them off. Okay, so there's some launching device that sends them out of the pallet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't good. you remember the, the beginning of the $6 million man? When they dropped him, <laughs> then he fired up his engine and he took off. I think it's the same deal. He's, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, the reason why the program revolves around putting missiles on cargo pallets is so that the weapons can be rolled on and off a cargo transport without any modifications to the aircraft. As soon as I read that, I was like, that's a damn good idea. Well, yeah, that's, you run out that's of pallets. a good call. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you're going to recover them all. Thank you, security yeah. forces. Parat. Please sit down. <laughs> <laughs> What's the cost of a pallet versus one of those missiles? It's a piece of aluminum, but it's a six-inch base built in <laughs> on a pallet. Yeah, I'm telling you, there's a six. Yeah. You got to have six inches on one side of the pallet to load it on a cargo aircraft. Somebody yeah. escort him out, please. I'm sorry. Hey, this this goes back to that other conversation we had, where the dummies were being 
the drone aircraft, like dummy aircraft, yeah. being launched yeah. out of cargo planes. Right. Yeah. And we got to get back to that that A ten story about how they're repurposing the A ten because it's interesting. Um, oh yeah. Because this the they have a paragraph here about repurposing other aircraft. So maybe we can cover that A ten one next week. But it says Rapid Dragon is not the only U.S. Air Force effort to get more use out of its aging fleet of aircraft. Last August, the service also tried out using the venerable B-52 bomber as a cargo hauler in order to bring maintenance equipment out to the battlefield with them. Wow. In, De- in December, the yeah, you got a C-130 cargo dropping a JASM. And you got a B-52 bomber hauling cargo. <laughs> but, I mean, what how else do B-52s do? It is how does that work? Like, oh, no, they're using them a lot now. Well, they were in Afghanistan. Uh, right, right. But, I mean, uh, you know, you got that huge aircraft there. It's like, hey, put some, oh, yeah. put some equipment on them. Let's, let's haul them around. So, is it dropping, like, tools and equipment? What the B fifty two? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I have not. <laughs> Bombs away. Here's your wrenches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's just weird. I'm, I mean, don't. When you, I wonder why you couldn't put if you're turning the B fifty two into a cargo of some sort. Why couldn't you launch your your red your dragon from that and have the C one thirty drop in whatever the B fifty two is doing? Since well, it was, I, I, I I guess they're just trying to think out of the box. Okay. Yeah, so um, in December, the Air Force also tried using a C-17 transport jet to refuel a B-2 stealth bomber, which had never been done before, obviously, according to a press release. So I think they're just trying, um, with the cost of these new, I mean, they, they can't replace all these old planes, right, with, with something new. Sure. So they're trying to repurpose it uh, for different missions. I I give him credit, um, but at the same time, how'd you like to be that C-130 guy who's just a, you know, he's, he's a trash hauler, right? Isn't that what they call him? Trash haulers. And, you know, he's got a, he's got a cushy job. He's like, ah, I got to fly, I got to fly some cargo over here. You know, I'll be back before. And then they're like, Hey, all of a sudden you're a high priority target. Cause you got a jazz in the back. He's like, Mother. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Try to escape and evade that thing. <laughs> yeah, he's like, shit. <laughs> But of course, it is a standoff, so you know they're not even going to get close. But, but you think the enemy sees any plane? They're just going to shoot every plane out of the air now, right? Yep. Um. So, uh, you know, good on the Air Force for having some flexibility. Probably born out of necessity due to money, um, and also because they're trying to even some playing field if we ever go to war with China. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, hey, we, we cool need some more, give it that. Yeah, we need some more capability out of out of what we have. Right. So I give them credit. You know, the Air Force is, has become pretty inflexible since the days uh of its inception. Hmm. So it's nice to see them gonna go back that way. Yeah. So that B-52 article, there's a whole article on an exercise they participated in out of Barksdale. Uh-huh. It's they have specially modified basic cargo containers that they load in the bomb bay. Okay. And it's designed to decrease the logistical footprint of future deployments of bombers. And then also um, incorporated with the rapid deployment concepts. Well, that, that makes, makes sense. sense. They're, yeah. <laughs> They're I mean, it makes all sense. If, exactly. Yeah. So you need less aircraft i mean it's an unused area yeah so might as well fill it up with some heavy stuff i guess yeah that's it that's what i mean it's it's smart that they're finally going hey why fly back empty yeah Yeah. okay uh this one is pretty good the first active duty woman earns master gunner badge for army's abrams tanks and i had to look this up i didn't even know we had female tankers but yeah there's a few of them out there So, from Military.com reports, uh, the first female active duty soldier ever to graduate from a prestigious heavy armor course 
passed and graduated last month, the Army announced right before the calendar flipped to the new year. To the new year. Sergeant Cynthia Ramirez, a soldier at Fort Hood's 1st Cav Division, passed the M1A2 Abrams Master Gunner Course, which is a 43-day school that teaches non-com officers how to be weapons experts in heavy armored units across the Army. Now, I, I was trying to look up what a master gunner is, and I saw the course material, and it, sound, it sounds like uh, a master gunner uh, obviously knows the gun, but knows all the maintenance of the gun, knows the capabilities of the gun, the employment, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like this mini weapons officer for the Army. And then That's cool. once they get that badge, then they go and they, they advise for planning, um, but they're also, you know, they not only they know the capabilities of the gun, but they know the maintenance of it. They know what what needs to be done on it. So they're a big advisor to the commander. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So have they put them? That in, is pretty cool. Can they go into combat now, as a as a tanker? Well, that's what I was trying to look up, and I think they can. I think there's a handful of female tankers, uh, or, or tank crew people. Uh, in the army, I don't know how many. I couldn't quite figure that out, um, mm-hmm. but they are, are out there. So, um, and this Cynthia Ramirez um, just passed that forty-three day school and became a master gunner. Sergeant Ramirez, nice. So I she's know. the third. She's the third to get this badge. Uh, she graduated the course on December fourteenth, becoming the first active duty woman ever to earn the Abrams version of the coveted identification badge. But previously, uh, then Staff Sergeant Jessica Ray, who is a Florida National Guardsman, was the first woman to earn the Master Gunner designation for the Avenger weapon system, which is a surface-to-air missile system. Uh, Now, I know air defense has had females in it for a long time, because when they go combat arms, that's Infantry, armor, aviation, uh, and air defense was part of combat arms, but they always were integrated. They've been integrated, I think, the longest uh, for females in there. So Sergeant or Staff Sergeant Jessica Ray was the first woman to get the master gunner for the Avenger weapon system. Uh, In 2020, then Sergeant Shauna Tipton earned the brat earned the Master Gunner badge for the Bradley. So I I, I guess it's all weapon system dependent. Um, but, you know, she earned it, and uh, now she gets to wear the badge, and she gets to advise the commander. If Sergeant Cynthia Ramirez needs a crew, I, I volunteer based on her appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Okay. Thank you. Way to pull the movement back. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. Exactly. That's, <laughs> just, you know, telling you, like, mm. there's a picture in. Yeah. Yeah, she's good looking. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, that was a missed her. opportunity for me. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit I was just looking up the Avenger weapon system. <laughs> I'm sorry for not being. Well, the Avenger weapon system is a pretty attractive system. It's you. pretty cool, actually. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a. Uh, I think it's all self-contained too. It's pretty neat. It it's just like a Humvee with a massive missile or rocket turret on the top. Yeah, anti-air stuff on it. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, you fire it and then you you get the fuck out of there. <laughs> What's it called again? Avenger. The Avenger. Yeah, weapons. I tried to share screens, but Marty's like stingy with that shit. No, it's because of the licensing. <laughs> I know. That's what that's why I had to bring it back up. <laughs> Damn it. I fall for your shit all the time. I fall for your little verbal crap no. all the time. What no? Because I try to take what you're saying with merit and I was like, oh yeah. He's just bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's the I'm hoping man. he has parting words for me at the end of our podcast tonight. I'll come up with something. I normally do about 45 seconds before I need to say it. It's much like your career. Why prep? Yep. You got it done. Why prep? <laughs> Wing, it's worked for 27 years up till now. <laughs> so good on you, Sergeant Cynthia Ramirez. Uh, our next story is they just passed uh, 
the big budget omnibus with the military stuff in it last yeah. week. And one of the things that came out of that are is troops are now entitled to 12 weeks of leave after birth or adoption of a child. Yeah. So no, according cool. 12 weeks, 12 weeks. So yeah. according to a congressionally mandated policy signed last week, any service member welcoming a new child, any service member welcoming a new child can take up to 12 weeks of parental leave in the year following. In recent years, birthing parents have received from six weeks for uh, while non-birthing parents receive no leave. Wow. That no term sense. is just maddening. I know. Birthing parents. Birthing parents. Yeah, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Let it fly, know. man. Spit it out, man. <laughs> it... I know what you're going to yeah. say. I, I think I know what you're going to say. Um, I, I always go back to remember that Canadian officer that was at Buckley and he was like, oh, guess what? You want to talk shit to the basically to the U.S. commander? He was like, guess what? I'm going on paternity leave. And it was like six and months. It was a long time. It was a time. long ass time. And he did it with no remorse. That's for None. sure. And he looked at that Air Force commander that, and he's like, I'll see you later, basically. Essentially, yeah. And he was untouchable. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But didn't, 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 he, didn't he leave later for like some cruise? That, uh, that yeah. So after he got maybe? back, yeah. So after he got back, they, um, I guess, so the U.S. commander was trying to not get him to take that leave because they needed him. Yeah. And that's why he was like, no, man, this is my right. I'm good. Right. So they made it difficult for him. Oh, they did. And I so, did yeah. And so when he got back, he was like, guess who just joined the Canadian yachting team? And the season is all year. That's not what it was. It was something like that. It was like <laughs> some Canadian, like it was a pro a Canada military, military team, you know, kind of yeah. thing. But I knew um, he'd left for a long time. Yeah, basically. It was <laughs> and they couldn't backfill that position because no. he was, you know, overseas. Yeah. For, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that works real well, except now you 12 weeks. Well, now that's both parents, 12, right? 12 now weeks. both parents are entitled yeah, yeah, yeah. to 12 weeks of leave to bond with a new child or on top of any doctor recommended convalescent leave for the mother. Um, so, but here's the thing it said within that year. Yeah. Somebody's going to get, yeah. Somebody's going to get screwed and give birth on December 28th. And they'll be like, well, you should have <laughs> taken it within the year or better yet. Sergeant Smith, you're deploying in two months. Yeah. Run home yeah. and say, honey, we need to get pregnant. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. Well, that, it's that's funny. Cause you know, they, they publish these articles and a normal non-military person will read it. And they're like, hey, good for them. But all of us who've been in the military, who've seen policies just been used oh, yeah. for nefarious purposes, I'm like, oh, they're going to game this bigger <laughs> shit. <laughs> yep. You're never going to see. If if they're both military, you're like, you're never seeing. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Gone. Yeah. Well, I knew it, along that same lines, I ran across a guy, uh, I can't remember where it was, but he knew he had gone like three years or something without taking a fit test for record because he had worked that, um, you know, the profile system the right way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he had like that window that you can take the test and like he got hurt again or, you know, on purpose or whatever it was. And it just kept, it just kept going. It was like, holy shit. But it was all legal. But he knew it. He knew how to get I away with it. I remember that. And he, I, I, he, he hadn't would, taken a test in a couple of years. He would take three tests off, and then he would pass his fourth. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It would flag. <laughs> yeah. So he would always fail two or three tests and then pass the fourth one or the third one. And then... 
and then he would be good for another year and a half. Because it was so long. Because you fail, oh, yeah. then you got to go into that program where you try to get yourself back. And um, he j- he took everything out to the last day. The new policy was- normalizes parental leave policies across the services, starting with children born or placed after December 27th, 2022. And this policy was signed into law with the 2022 National Defense Authorization Act in December. What's the speculation of having more children being born in the military now? uh, Well, sure. But it it even goes for adoption. If you adopt somebody, you get to stay home. So I don't know. I I, kind of look forward to going to work when my daughter was young. And I was like, (laughs) okay, I'll see you later. (laughs) And I'm out. Uh, they did say they did have some caveats there that, uh, like if you have a school coming up, then you can oh, take man. that 12 weeks after you complete the school. So that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty cool. I wonder what it's going to do because this is all a retention and recruiting oh, kind of thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I wonder what it's going to do to the manning because that's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. Well, I mean, 12 weeks, and we've been around a shop of young airmen. There's a lot of, I mean, there's multiple people pregnant at any one time, probably. Yeah, right. Right? And that goes in, like, deployment cycles and stuff like that. That can really deplete a whole shop pretty quickly. Absolutely. That's what I was going with. You, I, I guarantee you see an increase of pregnancies or even foster or uh, I'm sorry, adoptions in the, in the near, in the near future in the military. Yeah, it could be. Well, I was just worried about the the manning. Yeah. Right. Just the manning aspect. I know it's meant to be a retention thing and it's a good thing, but it's definitely going to be a hard thing to manage then. Yep. I, you know, it'd be interesting because they, they have something about if they're on deployment, uh, I, I can't remember what they said, but they're, they're, they make some allowances for them on deployment. I don't know how. Uh, but yeah, you you're going to, I mean, hell, people were getting, <laughs> airmen were getting married just to move out of the barracks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> right. So here you got three months off and your wife had a kid and you get three months off? Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Three months out of every year, if you keep pumping them out, I suppose. <laughs> well, let me ask you, you know, when these policymakers come up with this, do you think they have the same discussions that we're currently having? How is this going to impact it? Or do you no. just go, oh, we're doing the right thing for people? No, no I mean, they want to, they they want the mark on the wall. It's like, look what we gave to the military. It's like, yeah, look how you screwed up, yeah. you know, all the manning and everything else. Um, but that's, but that's all those policies done that, right? So I mean it's all it's always just difficult to is that is the is the greater good done, you know? I I, think it, I, yeah, I know. But that but the military is so non-normal compared to society. You know, yeah. if you have somebody working at Ever Jones or something like that, and you're like, hey, my kid, you know, I I'd like to bond with my kid and that kind of thing. Um, that's a little bit different than signing up for the military. But because retention is so low, they have just, they're trying anything they can do to try to make it palatable for these people, for, for the young people who don't want to come in the military. You know, they've always shown the studies that they, they, they don't see it as a, as an option anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're trying to sweeten that deal. But then the people you're going to get up, get in, taking advantage of that deal is not the greatest military person in the world. I can't mm-hmm. imagine what General George Patton would say about this whole thing. Ah, he'd be slapping you. He'd be slapping the kid. <laughs> what are you doing do, doing being born during a war? <laughs> Talking about having a child. <laughs> you can't do that. I think it's uh, we're in that one we're in that downtraft cycle where after there's no active war, then all the military starts to you know, Manning starts to decrease significantly. Right. Yeah. Um, but wasn't but, that budget? That budget was 
Democrat led, and it's freaking one of the biggest we've ever seen. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the uh, allocations are. Yeah, I don't know how much is actually going to pump stuff up. I just want to give the. I mean, we're always taking sides, so I want to give every side equal verbal abuse and credits. <laughs> I want well, to go right down the middle. Put yourself. And punch them all. Let's say, Jake, Superintendent Jake. Yeah. You have a male to male couple military yep. in your yep. unit. Right? Yeah. They just had their baby born. Yeah. Because one of them donated the sperm. So now yep. they have their new baby, and you ain't going to see either one of them for three months. I know. That's rough. <laughs> that's going to suck. That's going to suck. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, Think about a six man deep shop. Yeah. And and I know for a fact that while we were instructing in that four year period, Chris was pregnant with two kids. Lori Browning was pregnant with two kids. Yeah. Oh, uh, List had her kids out there. Oh, shit. That's right. Uh, um, And this is just in the instructor cadre. In in that one flight. Oh my god. I mean, and I think we had like a 10 or 12 person deep shop. Yeah. And can you imagine if and then the brownings were mill to mill, lists were mill to mill. Yeah, yeah. Chris and I are mill to mill. So you that's you know <laughs> that's a lot of fun. That's a lot of freaking leave. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta figure it out. Not much work getting done. I don't know how yeah. I don't know how security. But, but we were at the schoolhouse. Like I, the class flow wasn't stopping. That's right. But I don't know how a security forces squadron ever has enough people to man the gate. Yeah. Because everybody I mean, knows no. security forces gets around, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the mornings they always vol they always non vol a bunch of people. From all the units on Peterson. Right, because security forces are over in a bunker dropping Easy. <laughs> messing around. <laughs> Easy. Easy. Probably not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Hey, we need yeah. we need more uh we need more ILO taskings out here to man the gate. Why? Because security forces are getting each other pregnant the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> this whole time. I will say you put a man and a woman somewhere out in the dark. Things happen. <laughs> yeah. You got a baby airman on the way. <laughs> and six months of not seeing those two. Oh man. Yeah. All right, last story. I I, I picked it because uh I thought it was make believe. Uh but for 60 years, the Navy has been training dolphins and sea lions. To keep yeah. rivals away from its most sensitive hardware. Yep. And this ah. was serious. This was serious. I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah. Some Aquaman stuff here. Uh, and, uh, and Marty, I've got one for you, and I bet Jake has heard of it. The Incredible Mister Lippet. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard of that movie? Yeah, I remember. Oh my god! When I was really, really young. Don Knotts falls in the yep. water, becomes a fish. Yep. Oh, helps the Navy locate German ships. Oh, well, maybe that's where this concept came from. Actually, it didn't. It came from uh, like some uh, sea show, you know. Um, yeah. So, since 1959, the U.S. Navy has trained a small force of bottlenose dolphins and sea lions to recover lost equipment, intercept intruders in ports, and detect buried sea mines. Uh, This year, the Navy sought to end one of those marine mammals' most important missions, hunting for and neutralizing mines buried in the seabed, and use sophisticated underwater vehicles and sensors instead. But there's a problem. That technology hasn't yet equaled a dolphin's unique ability to find mines. That's crazy. So Congress balked using the 2023 defense bill to bar the Navy from retiring 
its mine detecting dolphins or ending post uh, port security training for its marine mammals until it deploys new mine countermeasure systems that are as good or better. I was like, mm-hmm. wow, they really they got that stuff going on out there. Oh, wow, that's, crazy. that's pretty cool. I mean, I guess if you can train a, a dog to sniff a bomb. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, how it began, the first Oceanarium with Dolphin shows opened in St. Augustine, Florida in 1938 and featured dolphins performing tricks with fish-toting trainers. That drew the Navy's interest. In 1959, it began work with mammals for mine countermeasure missions and established the Marine Mammal Program a few years later. The program worked with sharks, rays, and sea turtles, but settled on dolphins and sea lions. How would you like to get the status report of those early program? <laughs> That's what <laughs> I was the just shark thinking. Doing? Yeah, he's fine in the mines, but he's eating the trainers. <laughs> hey, uh, he's out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he failed. How about how about let's uh, avoid that one? Sea what? turtles. Um, they're the turtles accurate, but it takes them six months to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Those I, I, here's the thing. I don't see a lot of any of those other animals in aquatic shows or in aquatic training situations. Right. right? What's the Navy going? What about sharks? <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, I want to have some sharks in this. <laughs> Do you have a preference of what kind? Which kind of looks coolest? How about the kind that don't eat the trainers? Sergeant, Hammerheads find, look pretty find cool. private Aquaman. Yeah, no <sighs> kidding. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, a cool thing. They've been doing it for a long time, though. I, I guess so. But it, yeah. It, so, bottlenose dolphins are born with a biological sonar that they use to navigate and find food. Navy personnel using food as a reward train them to use it to locate objects that electronic sonar might miss like mines, enemy swimmers, or lost weapons. The whiskered sea lion, (laughs) they have to put whiskered in there. (laughs) The whiskered sea lion has keen eyesight and and an extraordinary sense of directional hearing, giving it a natural Hmm. ability to locate food or, with Navy training, to find mines or human intruders in the murkiest water. Well, often seen at the surface, both are deep divers. Sea lions can dive 900 feet, and trained bottlenose dive- dolphins have dived more than 1,000 feet, which is nearly seven times deeper than most humans can go. So, okay, that makes I mean, sense. Eventually, you, so you, what do they do? They report back then? I, yeah. I'm not sure. Like I've, got a, I've got a news or, or a picture, and there's a dolphin with basically a camera on its fin. Oh really? It's strapped to yeah, strapped to its fin. Um, but it says they're trained to find intruders. Yeah. So basically, other divers. Does it, does it just return? And like, hey guys, until it's trainer, you know. <laughs> like, or does man, it bite the crap out of the guys? Like, and a dolphin saw one. Now what? Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't now, find exactly. it. Only a dolphin can find it. Why don't we bad. arm the dolphin? Right? Some kind of munition fired off the dolphin's back. <laughs> I don't I'm not sure Peter would enjoy that. Well, the, the dolphin's not getting hurt. In fact, they're sending they're sending the dolphin to hurt humans. So Peter might enjoy that actually. <laughs> this is where Austin Powers got it, like with lasers. With lasers, right. Sharks with lasers. Uh, it does say the Navy is one of a few military forces with marine mammal programs. Notably, Russia has used trained dolphins to guard important naval facilities. The U.S. sent mine hunting dolphins and sea lions to Vietnam in 1970, and dolphins helped guard ships in Bahrain in 1987 and in the northern Persian Gulf in 2003. Well, you don't hear anything. That's pretty cool. That's cool. Well, right. And this is what I'm leading up to. The U.S. Navy Dolphins have also patrolled during major public events and contributed to public safety, even when not on duty. Two dolphins inadvertently found a rare 130-year-old torpedo buried off Coronado, California, while training in 2013. 
Aside from brief public statements, however, the mammal's real-world missions remain classified. Hmm. Ah, Classified, huh? We generally do not discuss or release operational details of the marine mammal program for security reasons. (laughs) Uh, And whoever this guy is, Wilson, who's part of the uh, program, uh, he did. He also did not make program officials or trainers available for interviews, citing ongoing program-related issues. So, other on, on an unclassified world, we have no stats to report. Right. We have no nothing. So, are these guys effective? Or like, ah, oh, that's classified. <laughs> or is it just a boondoggle? Yeah. Well, it's probably it classified. Deeper. You could envision these guys shadowing ships, you know, crossing an inlet or in the Atlantic, trying to keep other subs off them or stuff. You know, I don't know. It's interesting. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was kind of science fiction, but they're really doing it. But they have no proof. They have no. They can't tell you how how good they are. And you would think if they were that good, they would be touting that to like as a deterrent. Well, I I think they would. It's problematic because it's people have a problem with using animals, you know, right, right. especially well, dolphins, super intelligent. So I think it's classified one for the mission purposes. And but then nobody, two, but nobody two, complains because it's about, problematic. But nobody complains about the service dogs or the the military dogs. Yeah, <laughs> I just envision a Navy SEAL jumping out of an airplane. With a combat seal strapped to its chest, <laughs> like those service dogs, you know, <laughs> got his little goggles on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, a, a seal holding on to the dorsal fin of a heavily armed dolphin. Yes, go. They're in a chest harness, just <laughs> going in. I want to know how they train those dogs that they jump out of airplanes with, like. Who's going to be the first guy that's going to volunteer for that? Like, is this dog going to be calm the whole way, or is it just going to be? <laughs> it's going to maul my face, frothing right at the mouth, <laughs> mauling everything, freaking the hell out. <laughs> and I is mean, he going to want to do it again? It. Yeah, but I mean, you can't drug the dog because you need the dog right on right. the ground when it's like, okay, let's rub that sedative off. <laughs> I just but, want to see that one guy that that has that dog, yeah. That is even more aggressive than all the other ones. He's got the crazy dog, and he's like, "Gosh, dang it! It's my turn to jump." Dog saliva splashing back on his goggles. Got piss all <laughs> running down his legs. Gets, <laughs> he hits the ground, and everybody's just laughing at him. Oh my god. <laughs> you know his team members would be like, "You smell like dog pits." <laughs> like, you freaking reek. Well, yeah, that's the navy. That's the modern way. navy. So, uh, uh, but apparently the 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 subs and the under and the submersible stuff that they're trying to develop to find all the same stuff that the sea lions and dolphins are finding uh, is. Just inadequate. I guess it's not as good as huh. these animals are finding. So, so they said, "Don't oh, keep using the dolphins and sea lions until you get something better." So well, there we go. However, you know the ten people with that AFSCN are happy as shit. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, that's it for this week, gentlemen. Listeners, on behalf of my senior NCOs, I'd like to thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please leave a like and share the podcast with someone else. Let us know how we did in the comments, and as always, make sure to download the next episode for more service headline news. Gentlemen, I'll see you next week.